Hello, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. I hope everyone had a chance to get a little a bit of food and stretch the legs, maybe. Uh, I want to extend one more very sincere measure of gratitude towards Professor Robert Post for delivering that fantastic lecture. Uh, our next panel, the theme is Compelled Speech and Individual Rights. This panel will be moderated by Dan Conkle. Uh, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Very good. Uh, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to anyone who is newly joining us. Uh, I hope we can build on what was really a terrific morning and uh, a wonderful lecture by Professor Post. So uh, two quick uh, reminders, I guess, 20 minutes per person for the presentations. Then we'll have some Q&A back and forth among the panelists, the broader symposium participants, also uh, Q&A. Uh, with folks in the audience, uh, please use the, uh, uh, the Q&A feature on, on the Zoom for that. For CLA e-credit, in case you didn't, weren't here in the morning or hadn't heard, watch for a CLA attendance code, uh, which will be relayed via chat once we get to the Q&A portion of the event. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce our first panelist, Jesse Hill, who is Dean and uh, Judge Ben C. Green, Professor of Law at Case Western talking uh, on the topic, look who's talking, conscious, conscience, complicity, and compelled speech. So Jesse, take it away. Thank you, uh, Dan. Um, I, uh, I wanna clarify, I'm not the Dean, I'm actually the Associate Dean for Faculty uh, Development. Close and enough, we don't, we don't uh, you know, close enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a nice promotion though, I appreciate it. Um, so thank you. Yeah, um, I'm actually, I have a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for this portion and then I will um, start talking again. So um, if somebody, because it, it sometimes my the video disappears when I share my screen, if somebody could just like break in and interrupt me if you do not see my screen um, when, I, when I ask you. Okay, uh, do you see it? Are we good? Yeah, okay. Here we go. All right. Um, so um, the title of my talk is Look Who's Talking, Conscience, Complicity, and Compelled Speech. And um, so what I want to do in this talk, just to give a little overview, is that I'm, I'm starting from the observation that in a, many claims where um, individuals raise religious objections to participating in or engaging in government mandated conduct, those claimants also assert compelled speech claims. So they claim both that engaging in particular conduct forces them to be complicit in particular acts that they deem sinful for religious reasons, and it also forces them to speak a message or endorse a message with which they disagree. Um, for example, and I'll talk about some of these examples throughout, but um, in cases challenging the requirement for employers to provide insurance um, that covers contraceptives under the Affordable Care Act, um, some of the employers subject to the mandate raised both kinds of claims, free speech, uh, compelled speech, and uh, religious freedom. This was also true, um, again, at the lower court levels in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case um, the, uh, in which a baker uh, wanted to refuse to provide a cake for a wedding cake for a same-sex couple despite a state public accommodations law. Um, he raised both free speech and free exercise claims. Um, actually, both claims have, were in play in a case that's pending right now before the Supreme Court, uh, Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, although it was, it's really only the free exercise claim that's in front of the US Supreme Court. Um, the, the plaintiffs in that case who were uh, Catholic social services agencies who did not wish to um, place uh, adoption agencies that did not wish to place children with same-sex couples claimed that the state law requiring them to do so uh, both violated their free speech rights and their religious freedom. So uh, I want to suggest here that these sorts of claims tend to go hand in hand because they are... Uh, structurally sort of similar, they address similar harms. And, um, but then also I wanna note that doctrinally, the compelled speech claims are often rejected or, um, or often considered to be weaker when either courts either think that the speech is not attributable 
to um, the speaker or uh, that the speaker can distance himself, herself, itself from the, from the speech. And that um, courts, however, do not look at this issue of sort of ability to distance oneself and attribution in the context of religious complicity claims. And so what I want to argue here is that courts might uh, probably should look at these sort of um, uh, principles in the context of religious complicity claims, not just in the compelled speech context. So, um, I'm trying to figure out how to advance my slide here. There we go. So what is a compelled speech claim? We've been talking about this quite a bit already, right? Um, it's when a, a, an individual claims that the government is forcing them to um, uh, carry a message with which they disagree or that they don't want to carry the classic case, others have mentioned it this morning is, and, and this at noon is West Virginia v. Barnett um, involving the Jehovah's Witnesses who were children who refused to salute the flag while reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, as many people have noted that case itself, although it is a classic compelled speech case also combines um, religious freedom elements uh, in, in that case. Although um, it, this, that's not a complicity case for reasons I'll discuss in a little bit, but it's, a, it's arguably also a religious freedom case. Uh, but you know, we see these, uh, again, other, other folks who spoke this morning talked about how broad and, and, and uh, Professor Post also about how expansive the scope of a compelled speech claim can be and what things can count now under a Supreme Court doctrine as speech um, it can include things like paying money, right, into a into a program, and um, paying money to a labor union, etc., um, can constitute speech. Baking a cake, possibly arranging flowers for a wedding—at least those claims have been made—could be considered speech that um, cannot be compelled, consistent with the First Amendment, right? So this is a potentially broad range of not just speech but also expressive conduct. That falls under that category. Well, so what is a complicity claim? This might be a little less familiar since it isn't the, the focus of this, um, specifically of this symposium as much. Um, well, a complicity claim, actually Ivanka has it wrong. She does not have the correct definition of what complicity is. So I will tell you um, what complicity actually does mean. Um, generally what it means in the context where I'm using the term, is that religious claimants argue that the, the government is making them do something that violates their religious beliefs because it makes it, because it is forcing them to facilitate somehow the sinful acts of another person, of a third party. Um, so the contraception cases, again, just to use that example, is um, the argument is that the employers are being forced into a state of religious complicity because they are facilitating the uh, third party, the, the employee's use of contraception. The use of the contraception is the actual sin. And, um, but there's a sort of extension to the employer because they claim they're being forced to facilitate that conduct and that that is a substantial burden on their religious belief. So like I said, this is not the case of Barnett because in Barnett, the students were being forced to salute the flag. That act of saluting violated their um, their First Amendment, their their religious freedom or their religious beliefs, and so you know that was just sort of a, a more direct burden on their religious exercise. So just to distinguish the two kinds of claims, and um, parties raise these sorts of complicity claims under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act if if it's a federal because this RIFRA applies to federal uh, acts by the federal government. So they might uh, raise that as a RIFRA claim if the act is that's burdening them is, is a, an, a federal legislation or a federal act. Um, they may also raise uh, this sort of complicity claim under a um, state equivalent of RIFRA. Some states have equivalent laws they may raise it under the free exercise clause as well. And what happens usually there is that uh, these individuals say that 
there is some sort of a hybrid, right? So again, coming back to the relationship to the compelled speech claim that they've raised at least a colorable compelled speech claim that um, this, um, this therefore gives them a, a, what's called a sort of hybrid right because there are two separate rights that are, are implicated in this case. And according to um, the Supreme Court case of Employment Division v. Smith, that allows them to get strict scrutiny right, um, uh, for their claim, for the, uh, the law that's burdening their rights. So in any case, um, often religious claimants are, are using these claims and arguing that, um, using them to get strict scrutiny or arguing that they should get strict scrutiny uh, applied to the government act that burdens their religion. Okay, and as I noted, so compelled speech and complicity claims often go hand in hand in these cases um, because they both are sort of, um, they, they share this similar structure and I'm, I'm gonna argue next also uh, have a, a very similar, um, address a similar set of harms. And so um, particularly in cases where we see uh, forced uh, subsidies or paying into government welfare programs and the like, that can look like speech, that can look like conduct, that can look like expressive conduct. And so it's easy, it's a short step from there to make both claims. And so, and I'm also going to touch on a few of these cases. I'm not actually going to have time to talk about all of them. But, um, some of these cases that have raised, discussed, or raised both compelled speech and complicity claims. Um, so, the fact <laughs> so the fact just to, to um, touch on the, um, the nature of uh, uh, these claims in a couple of different cases. Again, this case has been discussed during the um, other presentations, Nifla v. Becerra, which required, um, in which a California state law required crisis pregnancy centers to provide accurate um, information and disclosures about public uh, uh, reproductive health care services and, and about whether they had a licensed doctor on staff. Um, this was um, uh, claimed to be compelled speech. In addition, however, the uh, plaintiffs, the crisis pregnancy centers in that case did raise, it was not addressed at the Supreme Court level, but did raise uh, free exercise claims as well, um, in which uh, it seems that um, they were basically making a complicity argument, although they did not phrase it as such. Um, but they made, an, essentially, the, 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 the burden on their religious freedom seems to have come from the fact that they were in some way facilitating access to abortion, which was a crime. Um, um, also, again, I've, I've mentioned this case a couple times now, Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, and there, were, there was not just the Hobby Lobby case, but a number of lower court cases um, and across the country sort of with different um, sorts of employers who um, many of whom, again, raise not just these um, religious freedom claims under RIFRA, saying that being required to cover contraception violates their um, First Amendment um, free exercise or, RIF or um, RIFRA rights, but also that it violated their um, free speech rights. Because it compelled them to sort of endorse the government's message about, um, you know, about contraception, essentially. So um, what I want to suggest now is that actually both kinds of claims address very similar harms as well. So, and I, I categorize, categorize these as both inward facing and outward facing harms. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're, um, I'm, you're getting some, some feedback. I'm just getting these notes here in the chat. I apologize. Um, I will try to um, minimize the minimize the noise on my end. Um, okay. So so there are both these uh, inward facing harms and these outward facing harms. Um, in terms of compelled speech, the outward facing harms, the common one that commentators and and courts point to is misattribution. So the idea that um, 
listeners will be mistaken as to whose message is being conveyed and think that the speaker really um, embraces this message. And sometimes maybe that's even the point of it. Um, if you think of some, some programs in which uh, the government, uh, uh, you know, is forcing a speaker to speak, it's, it's because they, maybe they think that the speaker is an appropriate person to carry this message and they, they want to take advantage of who the speaker is. Um, in the complicity context, there's a, there's a sort of analog to this, which is a, in, in, in the Catholic religion, of course, specifically, but it's, I think, a more generalizable term, is this idea of what the, what the Catholics refer to as scandal, which is the idea that you may lead others into sin by suggesting that the conduct you're facilitating and not, um, you know, not cutting off is somehow acceptable or widespread because of your own actions. So your own actions lead to that mistaken impression. And then there are also these inward facing harms that again, folks have talked about maybe courts tend to somewhat under um, appreciate, I think, about um, harm to uh, sort of, uh, you know, there, well, there's a partly there's just a bodily integrity claim in terms of compelled speech that you're being forced to physically use your body in some cases to actually speak the government's message, but also just this sort of internal harm that you, um, you know, we like to think of ourselves, our, our persons as having a sort of coherent set of beliefs. We tell ourselves a particular story about who we are and if we're being forced to act in a way or to do things and say things that are inconsistent with that, that that is um, sort of psychically harmful. And then finally, this kind of concern, and it's associated with Shauna Schifrin, as I think Professor Post raised before, this concern that you are going to kind of, um, by being forced to mouth the government's message again and again, you're going to start to sort of um, mentally on some level accept that message, or else you are going to just be um, forced into the state of insincerity that is sort of harmful in and of itself. And again, with complicity on the religion side, I think we could say it's some of the same harms. There's this spiritual harm of, of you know, that, that you know that you are sharing in this sin, that you are advancing sin, which is itself, you know, a bad thing. And that you are, you want to maintain action that's consistent with your religious values, um, but, but you can't, you're being prevented from doing so. Uh, but as I noted, courts will often consider these two elements, attribution and disassociation, in the compelled speech context, but not in the um, in connection with complicity claims. So, um, for example, in a case called uh, Rumsfeld v. Fair, where uh, the uh, uh, where law schools were being required to allow military, the military to come and recruit on their campuses. Um, the, and I'll talk about that case a little more in a, in a moment. Um, the court rejected the compelled speech claim in part because of um, issues around attribution and disassociation. This contrasts with a, a case out of the um, Sixth Circuit involving um, uh, actually mandatory ultrasound. And in that case, it actually was not just a mandatory ultrasound before having an abortion, but the doctor was actually required to narrate um, what was happening on the screen and describe it, whether the speaker, whether the patient, sorry, wanted to hear it or not. Um, and in that case, uh, the court um, uh, also similarly addressed these issues of attribution and disassociation and suggested that they might undermine the, uh, the speaker, the physician's compelled speech claim. So, uh, but I, wanna, I just wanna say a little bit more about Rumsfeld v. Fair. So um, Solomon Amendment, it was a federal um, law um, with the um, government withholds funds if the universities restrict military recruiters. Um, uh, Fair claimed that this violated their First Amendment rights uh, by requiring them to assist in the military recruitment. And the Supreme Court said, no, it does not. It 
it does not constitute compelled speech. And then specifically recognize that they said nothing about the recruiting suggests that law schools agree with any speech by recruiters and nothing in the, the Solomon Amendment restricts what law schools may say about the military's policies. So, you know, presumably the schools could just put up signs that say we're doing this under protest or we don't agree with the, the military's views about LGBT rights, things like that. Okay, but um, again, in the complicity context, these concepts never make an appearance. And uh, in, in some of the cases, like for example, in the lower court, in the Hobby Lobby case, the lower court very explicitly rejected the idea that um, you had to consider in connection with the complicity claim, whether the reasonable observer would think that the conduct was um, uh, the individual's conduct and, um, uh, whether you know they could disassociate themselves and just simply said you know we're not going to question what the individual says the the sort of the meaning of their actions are um, in in religious terms, um, but I just want to end by and, and I'm going to stop on this note and I think I'm getting close to time here anyway by saying um, that I think we could apply these concepts in the context of complicity claims as well, and in particular I think we could look at things like whether um, an individual's conduct uh, would be attributed to them or to simply to compliance with a government regulatory scheme. And so here's the picture of, of the woman here is Kim Davis, who was the clerk in Kentucky who refused to issue uh, on religious grounds, refused to issue marriage licenses to same sex couples. I think you know no one would have thought if a government employee pursuant to uh, a legal requirement was issuing marriage licenses to all eligible individuals on equal terms, a kind of all comers policy that that, that was her action or in any way you know, attributable to her that she was in any way complicit with the actions that were taking place and instead would assume that this was being done because of the government, you know, the, the, the legal requirement. And similarly, there's really nothing in this, this, you know, that stops individuals from at least trying to distance themselves from the act that they think is making them complicit in order to, um, you know, to, to disassociate themselves. They can put up signs to express their disagreement. We talked about this in the NIFLA context. And so, um, you know, and I'll just leave it with the thought that I'm, I'm not convinced that these sort of um, this ability to disassociate necessarily fully addresses the potential kind of inward facing harms of complicity. But if it doesn't, I'm not sure that it um, addresses the inward facing harms of compelled speech either. So, so I mean, I tentatively wanna suggest that we should consider both attribution and disassociation in the context of, of complicity as well as compelled speech. But you know, leaving the caveat that it, the more important thing is that they should both have the same rules because they are such similar types of claims. And so if these claims are inappropriate in the complicity context, maybe it suggests, or these, these devices, these principles, then maybe it suggests they're inappropriate in the compelled speech um, context. And um, that is my presentation and I'll stop my screen sharing and apologies again for the noise problems. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. That was uh, fascinating. And, and I'm sure we'll have time for some Q&A and back and forth about that. Very interesting attempt to connect two different areas of law. Uh, so our next speaker, uh, Nadia Sawicki, is the, uh, I think I'll get this one right, let's start with the pronunciation perhaps, uh, Georgia Rith Rithel, Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Beasley Institute for Health Law and Policy, Loyola, Chicago. Uh, the title of Nadia's paper is Tort Law Implications of Compelled Physician Speech. So Nadia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, thank you to Caroline and Alex for the invitation to participate. And thanks to Caitlin and the Indiana Law Journal for facilitating this really wonderful event. Uh, I also have slides not quite as advanced uh, as my colleagues, uh, but I'll be sharing them. Uh, and if there are any problems, do uh, let me know. So now that we are midway through our conference, I'm going to offer you what I hope is an interesting intermission from pure constitutional law themes. 
Uh, what I'd like to offer you today is an argument about why compelled speech requirements in the context of informed consent to abortion are problematic, not just from a constitutional perspective, but also from a tort law perspective. So I'll be explaining the way that liability provisions in these laws are structured uh, and how that structure effectively eliminates the burden of proving three fundamental elements of the tort cause of action. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the main ways, as we've discussed, that compelled speech manifests itself in the healthcare sphere is in laws requiring physicians to communicate certain types of information in order to ensure a patient's informed consent to abortion. So under the common law of informed consent, setting these statutory abortion laws aside, physicians are required to make certain disclosures in order to secure a patient's consent to treatment. And there's a standard set of information um, that is expected to be disclosed really regardless of jurisdiction. And these include the patient's diagnosis and prognosis, the medical risks and benefits of the procedure that's being proposed, and the medical risks and benefits of any potential alternatives to that procedure. So as of March 1st, uh, 33 states have passed statutes that establish abortion-specific counseling requirements. 29 of these states specify particular types of information that doctors are required to disclose regardless of whether they believe that that disclosure is medically appropriate. In states that have these abortion informed consent laws, uh, legislatures typically identify specific categories of information that doctors are required to communicate. And this information that's required by statute often goes far beyond the traditional disclosures required under the common law doctrine of informed consent. So this is according to the most recent information collected by the Guttmacher Institute, um, some of the more common disclosures that are required in states with abortion informed consent laws. We've talked about describing the stages of fetal development, the gestational age uh, of the fetus, the ultrasound requirements, which may require a description of the ultrasound and the heartbeat, um, directing the patient to a state written brochure that provides information about abortion. And in addition to information about the procedure itself, these brochures often provide information about things like the availability of medical assistance and other social support resources, the fact that fathers have to pay child support, um, contact information for adoption agencies, and so on. Many states require uh, that doctors tell patients that abortion is linked to an increased risk of psychological problems, including suicide, um, that abortion may result in decreased fertility or may increase the risk of breast cancer. All of these risk disclosures have been called into question by the medical community. Um, and recently, some states have added in, uh, information uh, disclosures about the reversibility of medication abortion, which has also been refuted by the scientific community. Uh, and then finally, as a few folks have mentioned, some state statutes provide specific language that doctors have to use to communicate to their patients that the fetus is a human life, that personhood begins at conception, uh, that a mother has a constitutionally protected relationship with her fetus. So patient advocates, physicians, and legal scholars have challenged these laws on various ethical and policy grounds. They argue that the laws require doctors to violate fundamental principles of, inform of medical ethics by commuting information that is neither relevant nor medically accurate. Um, there are challenges to the idea that the state can interfere in the doctor-patient relationship for political goals. Um, there's arguments that these types of laws question the validity of women's ability to make informed medical decisions. Um, and some tort scholars have recently argued that these state-specific disclosure requirements can actually bleed over into medical practice in other states and in that way change the national standard of care. Um, and as you all know, and as my co-panelists have written about, there have been significant constitutional challenges uh, to these laws on both First and Fourteenth Amendment grounds. So both before and after the decision in NIFLA, um, numerous federal district and appellate courts had the opportunity to rule on the constitutional validity of these laws. Um, most of these courts ended up applying Casey's truthful, non-misleading, and relevant standard, uh, but there's been significant jurisdictional variation in terms of which provisions have been upheld and which have been enjoined. 
So after the decision in NIFLA, um, courts have been focusing on this factual and non-controversial requirement, which obviously is likely to be very influential as this kind of litigation moves along. So what I'd like to talk about now goes beyond the constitutional implications of these laws. So in addition to compelling doctors to speak, these statutes typically impose tort liability on doctors who fail to communicate or are unwilling to communicate the state's mandated messaging. And when I looked more closely at the liability sections in these laws, I found something very surprising. These statutes often impose liability on the basis of non-disclosure alone, effectively a form of strict liability, um, without requiring the plaintiff to prove anything beyond the fact that the doctor didn't commute the state's message. And this is trouble. So to understand why this is problematic, I have to offer first a brief refresher about how the common law of informed consent operates. Um, we know in a traditional negligence action, you gotta prove do, breach of a duty of care, compensable injury, uh, causation in fact, and proximate causation. Now in a common law informed consent action, these uh, requirements are a little bit more nuanced. So first, as I mentioned earlier, the duty of care um, is traditionally required with respect to the disclosure of information that's material to the patient's decision, so the medical risks and benefits of the procedure. In terms of cause and fact, uh, informed consent law's version of the cause and fact requirement uh, requires proof that if the doctor had made the required disclosures, a reasonable plaintiff wouldn't have consented to the procedure. And this is an objective standard, which I'll talk about in just a second. The proximate cause requirement as envisioned under common law requires the plaintiff to prove not only that they suffered a physical injury as a result of the procedure that they consented to, but that that physical injury was a manifestation of the risk that the doctor failed to disclose. And finally, we've got injury and damages. As I just noted, a patient bringing an informed consent claim has to prove a physical injury. Emotional or dignitary harms are not sufficient for a common law claim. Now, statutes establishing informed consent procedures to abortion either modify or eliminate each one of these requirements. So I mentioned earlier, the scope of required disclosure is much broader than under traditional common law. And with respect to the rest of the elements, most of these statutes are either silent or they explicitly reject them. So I'll walk you through each one of these to show you how this is problematic. So let's start with injury, right? The most foundational piece of an informed consent or any tort claim. Under common law, patient needs to demonstrate that they uh, experienced physical injury as a result of the procedure or, or as a result of the course of action that they chose. Um, state abortion informed consent laws don't require plaintiffs to prove any injury, physical or emotional, in order to recover. There's a lot of variability in how they're drafted, um, but many of them offer a really broad scope of recovery. Obviously, compensatory damages if there is an injury, punitive damages, statutory penalties, often three times the cost of the abortion, um, and recovery for wrongful death. And perhaps most importantly, these statutes contemplate recovery for purely emotional harm, which is really unheard of in the common law doctrines of either informed consent or malpractice. So this Nebraska statute explicitly rejects the physical injury requirement and imposes liability for purely emotional and dignitary harms. Finally, I wanna note that in the absence, uh, when we've got no physical injury requirement, that means that a patient could recover damages, statutory damages or punitive damages, for example, even if that patient chose not to proceed with an abortion. Right. So in other words, the physician's failure to communicate the state mandated message may result in liability regardless of the patient's course of action. So next, decision causation. This is informed consent law's version of the cause and fact requirement. Uh, the plaintiff has to demonstrate that an objectively reasonable person wouldn't have chosen that course of action had the doctor made the required disclosures. And in states with informed consent laws, there's typically no requirement that the plaintiff prove decision causation. Um, the few states that do address this question end up applying a subjective rather than an objective standard. So I've identified two states that establish that a physician's breach of the disclosure duty 
establishes a rebuttable presumption that this particular plaintiff would not have consented to the abortion. But as I noted, this is inconsistent with the traditional objective view of causation. Um, I was able to identify only one state, Alaska, that requires a plaintiff to affirmatively prove decision causation, but it still uses that subjective standard. Finally, injury causation. So because these statutes impose liability without requiring proof of injury, they obviously can't and don't require that the plaintiff prove a proximate causal relationship between the non-disclosure and the injury. So this chart shows how a common law informed consent claim might play out if we were to accept the disclosure requirements imposed by these state laws. So for example, if the law requires a doctor to disclose that abortion increases the risk of breast cancer, under common law, that patient would only be able to recover if she ultimately developed breast cancer, right? The injury has to be a manifestation of the undisclosed risk. Uh, if a doctor failed to disclose that the father has a duty to pay child support, the plaintiff can't recover for breach of informed consent unless that's the injury that she suffers. And when we look at some of the other required disclosures in these statutes, so for example, the fetus's gestational age, um, statement that the fetus is a human being, it's hard to imagine how under common law a plaintiff could ever recover for these uh, breaches, right? Common law informed consent requires disclosure of medical risks, right? But those statutory disclosures may have nothing to do with medical risks. And so it's hard to see how that injury causation requirement could be satisfied. So perhaps it's not surprising that none of these statutes impose any requirement for proving injury causation. The plaintiff's not required to prove an injury. It really doesn't matter what the nature of the non-disclosure was. And again, this really completely negates the common law elements of an informed consent cause of action. So in my last few minutes, I wanna talk about the broader implications here. Why should we care? I'm gonna use a simple, basic non-abortion related medical example um, to show you what would happen if we were to abandon these foundational elements of tort liability in other contexts. So let's imagine a patient who has debilitating back pain, has been experiencing this back pain for years, is considering surgery. The surgery is not guaranteed to be effective and it poses some risks, a risk of paralysis, a risk of infection. And just for fun, let's add a legislatively mandated disclosure um, that modifies the standard of care. Doctor has to also disclose that surgery increases societal healthcare costs. So here's our patient. Um, imagine first that the doctor fails to disclose any of these risks. The patient has surgery and it goes perfectly. Under the liability principles established by abortion compelled speech laws, this doctor could be liable for statutory damages, three times the cost of surgery, and potentially punitive damages. This is what happens when we eliminate the injury requirement. Next scenario, doctor fails to disclose the risk of infection. Patient has surgery and suffers precisely that result. But imagine that this patient's back pain has been so serious and so debilitating and so ongoing that we can prove that a reasonable patient would have undergone the surgery despite the 5% risk of infection. Again, the doctor could be liable for damages, compensatory damages included. And this is what happens when we get rid of the decision causation requirement. Finally, again, doctor fails to disclose the risk of infection. Uh, here, the patient goes through with the operation and suffers paralysis, a risk that the doctor did properly disclose. Again, doctor can be liable for damages despite the fact that the injury the plaintiff suffered was not a manifestation of the risk the doctor failed to, uh, failed to disclose. So you could argue that these statutes are just a case of abortion exceptionalism, right? This is a sui generis case. It's unlikely that the foundational elements of a tort cause of action would be abandoned in any other context. But I'd argue, um, and as we've heard throughout the day, there are a lot of other politicized areas of medical practice in particular, where legislatures might be inclined to control communication between doctor and patient. Maybe they want doctors to disclose information that is irrelevant or inaccurate or misleading, right? The more opiates doctors prescribe, the more they're compensated. True, but is that medically relevant? Um, if the doctor is forced to say that marijuana is addicted, right, is this an accurate statement of fact or is it just a claim the government wants to promote to reduce the use of medical marijuana? 
When a person commits suicide, even with a doctor's legal assistance, their family members suffer. Okay? This may be true, but is this an inherent risk of the procedure itself? This seems like more of a social risk than a medical risk. I need your spouse's consent before I prescribe masculinizing, masculinizing hormones. Right? This imposes a spousal consent requirement on medical care sought out by, by transgendered individuals. It regulates conduct, obviously, but what other implications might it have? Sexual orientation change therapy is a very effective treatment for patients struggling with their sexuality. So we know that states like California and New Jersey have passed legislation banning sexual orientation change therapy, um, but one could imagine a more conservative state taking a different approach, right? And requiring doctors to advocate for a service that's been found to be harmful to patients. Now, I've chosen these examples because I don't think it's unreasonable for state legislatures to think, Look, if we can pass laws compelling physician speech in the context of abortion, which is already independently constitutionally protected under the 14th Amendment, they might have even greater success in compelling physicians to speak on other politically charged issues that don't necessarily have their own independent constitutional basis. And if they pass statutes that follow the same approach as the abortion informed consent statutes with respect to physician liability, um, we may end up with the equivalent of a strict liability regime for doctors who refuse to communicate the state promoted messaging. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, again, a very interesting paper and I'm sure we'll have some questions and comments. So uh, next, uh, Caroline Malakorban, who is Professor of Law and Dean's Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami School of Law, speaking on compelled speech and the Pledge of Allegiance Revisited Requiring Parental Permission. Take it away, Caroline. All right. Um, so as I'm sure you all know by now, the case that essentially established the free speech right against compelled speech involved the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools. So in West Virginia versus Barnett, the Supreme Court held unequivocally that the schools could not force students to take the Pledge of Allegiance. The First Amendment protects your right to speak and your right to not speak. And while the Jehovah's Witnesses in Barnett opposed the pledge for religious reasons, Students today may have myriad reasons for not wanting to participate in this particular patriotic exercise. Now, they may also be Jehovah's Witnesses or have religious opposition to the pledge, or they may be non-believers and object to stating that we are one nation under God. Others support the Black Lives Movement and want to make a statement against racism by taking a knee during the pledge, much as Colin Kaepernick did to draw attention to police brutality against Black Americans. Despite this clear and quite famous case, Florida and Texas both passed laws that say public school children may opt out of the pledge only with their parents' permission. And the 11th Circuit upheld the law on the grounds that it promotes another constitutional right, namely parents' substantive due process right to control the upbringing of their children. This is a ridiculous conclusion, and I will tell you why in three parts. So the first part, is I'll explain that although the Supreme Court has been gradually chipping away at students' free speech rights in school, none of those justifications for curtailing students' speech in school applies to this. Next, I'll draw on free speech theory to explain why forcing students to pledge unless their parents let them out of it is so anathema to free speech and the values that underlie it. Finally, I will explain that even though promoting another constitutional right can be a compelling government interest, the due process right simply cannot carry the day in this case. All right, so 
to start with student speech in school. Although I suppose I should say, I should start with minor speech rights. And with the exception of access to girly magazines due to a case decided quite a while ago, student speech rights, or I should say minor speech rights are basically coextensive with adult speech rights. So this is not a case where minors don't have the same constitutional rights as adults. However, student speech rights in school may be curtailed for any number of reasons. As Robert Post was saying earlier, you can't start shouting in the middle of class. So there are limits on student speech in school, but none of them apply to a refusal to say the pledge. So yeah, I'm gonna go through the list of, of the limits on student speech in school. And the first is if the speech interferes with the rights of other students. So for example, just as racist speech might create a hostile work environment, racist speech in school can create a hostile school environment and interfere with the rights of other students. Failure to say the pledge does not infringe on anybody else's rights. The second limit on student speech in school is if the speech disrupts learning. Um, the fear of disruption is not enough. It has to be an actual disruption. Silence is not disruptive. The third limit on student speech is if the speech might be attributed to the school and it would be inappropriate for the school to say it. And this is stemming, this rule follows from a case where there is a school paper and the school worried that what they thought were age inappropriate articles would be viewed as their speech and the school upheld the rule that's saying, listen, if the speech is going to, if people are going to think the speech is the schools and it's age inappropriate, that speech can be limited. That was the third limit. The fourth is if the student speech is to a captive audience and is um, inappropriately body and lewd. And here the Supreme, and this arose from a case where a student was endorsing a friend of his for student office and his, and his speech was full of all kinds of double entendre. Um, and here the school said it was justified in punishing the student on the grounds that the school has a responsibility to teach students how to appropriately engage in civil discourse. Again, that's not a problem with a student not reciting the pledge. On the contrary, protesting racism by silently taking a knee is a perfect example of appropriate civil engagement. And then the final limit on speech, student speech in schools is if the speech advocates illegal uh, drug use. And this rule arose from a case where a student unfurled a giant banner that said bong hits for Jesus. Um, but I think we can all agree that refusing to take the pledge has nothing to do advocating illegal drug use. So really there is no existing rule that would justify limiting the student's refusal to take the pledge. Um, it should be fully protected by the free speech clause. And indeed the reason why it was deemed fully protective is that it really undermines all the reasons why we protect free speech in the first instance. So um, here I'm just gonna, again, I'm gonna run through, well, let me just say I, I, again, as I said earlier, um, the reason why we protect free speech is there's not a single reason. Some people prefer one reason to others, but there are often three main justifications for protecting speech. And that is it facilitates a marketplace of ideas. It is necessary for democratic self-governance and it promotes autonomy. And also there's this idea that we don't really trust the government to make decisions about what we can say or info that we can receive. And the compelled pledge 
is at odds with all of them. So starting with the marketplace of ideas justification for heightened protection for free speech is it's the idea that we protect speech in order to ensure that audiences have access to the widest possible array of information and viewpoints. But this is how we discover the truth. This is how we advance our knowledge. Um, forcing students to pledge distorts the marketplace of ideas for students at school. How? This is partly due to the fact that refusing to participate in patriotic exercises itself expresses a message. Ever since Colin Kaepernick took a knee during patriotic exercises at the start of football games to, pro to, to protest police brutality against Black Americans, students at school who also wish to show support for the Black Lives Movement um, they have taken a knee to, uh, during their school's pledge. Right now, again, it's not the only reason or message that a refusal to a pledge represents, but I'm, I'm gonna focus on that one for, for today. And, and, and protest from their peers is actually a great way for students to learn about systemic racism. Yet this mandatory pledge law makes it less likely that this viewpoint will be in the marketplace of ideas at school. And therefore it impoverishes the marketplace for students. And it doesn't just impoverish the marketplace, I'd also add it, it hinders the school mission of helping students develop those critical thinking skills and a sense of social awareness and social responsibility, one of the main charges of public education. So again, the first problem, the first goal of protecting free speech is to create a marketplace of ideas and forcing students to take a pledge unless their parents agree that they don't undermines the marketplace of ideas at school by removing a really valuable viewpoint. All right, that's the first problem. The, another justification or another reason why we have so much protection for free speech is that it's to facilitate our democratic self-rule. And protection of speech does this in two ways. One, <laughs> it helps people make informed political decisions, right? Free speech ensures a free flow of the type of information that citizens need to make informed political decisions. And again, Removing a free flow of the type of information citizens need, um, it, 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 removing a really valuable viewpoint frustrates students' ability to become fully informed on important political questions. But second, citizenship in a democracy is not just about voting for politicians and their policies. It's also about helping to shape policies. In short, as Robert Post has argued, free speech allows citizens to contribute to the political discourse and to help shape um, the discussion. And clearly, the law prevents students from articulating their political viewpoint in support of Black Lives Matter. And of course, when you take a knee or stay silent during uh, exercises, it's not just supporting Black Lives Matter, it's also a protest against the government, right? And, and this kind of protest is, is not new. Right? People have always expressed displeasure with the government by attacking or appropriating official government symbols, whether it's the American flag or the national anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance. So in this case, the government is not just suppressing a viewpoint, which itself is highly problematic, but a viewpoint that's criticizing the government. It's hard to imagine a more paradigmatic violation of free speech than the government censoring its critics. And once again, I will add that suppressing the speech is also contrary to one of the core missions of public education, which is to help students develop the skills necessary for citizenship. All right, so it impoverishes the marketplace of ideas. Um, it undermines 
democratic self-governance. And of course, the third reason we protect speech is to promote autonomy by allowing people to express themselves. And forcing people to speak when they would rather stay silent can already be considered an intrusion on autonomy. But being forced to articulate a viewpoint that's contrary to their own is very much an intrusion. So in short, the compelled pledge embodies all the harms of compelled speech. It diminishes the marketplace of ideas, it silences a powerful criticism of the government, and it insults the autonomy of the students who are compelled to articulate the government's ideological viewpoint. And it just should be unconstitutional, and indeed the Supreme Court has held it was unconstitutional. So why did the 11th Circuit uphold it? What was the compelling interest that justified the obvious intrusion on students' free speech rights? And according to the 11th Circuit, the answer is parental rights. So now this is the third part about the substantive due process right. Um, and this right dates to the Lochner era uh, and says that the Constitution protects parents' right to make decisions about their children's education and upbringing. But the right can't carry the burden of justifying the infringement on students' speech rights. So for, for several reasons. First, um, although this right is very old, it's actually not very strong. Uh, it comes into play when the state might terminate the parent-child relationship, um, but it even starts to have less force when you're talking about custody and visitation. And in education, while parents do have the right to decide whether or not to send their children to public school, once parents make the decision to send their children to public school, the right has never been recognized to let parents dictate what happens in the school. So anytime a parent has tried to make a claim that they have a substantive due process right to control the curriculum in some sort of way, it has been rejected. And this even includes a claim about corporeal punishment where the parent didn't want the school um, to, to exercise corporal punishment. And the school said, no, you're right to control the upbringing of your child does not extend to this kind of decision. So if it doesn't extend to that, it's hard to see why it would extend to the pledge. So that's the first reason. Really this right, it's not robust and it really does not exist vis-a-vis -vis controlling what goes on inside the school. Second, the right is generally asserted by parents against the state, not against their own children. It's supposed to be a limit on what the state can do. And moreover, when parents' wishes may harm their children, the Supreme Court has rejected the assertion of parental rights. So in a bunch of cases, even when combined with a religious claim, uh, the court has held that the parental rights do not trump things like labor laws or vaccination laws. Um, you just cannot use the right to the detriment of your children. And giving that forcing children to pledge is detrimental to their development and well being. Parental rights, assuming they even had any force in schools, would not prevail. As I said, the right is about the parent vis-a-vis -vis the state, not the parent vis-a-vis -vis their children. And finally, um, the Supreme Court has upheld parental consent over minors exercising constitutional rights, but only when it thought that children's immaturity um, combined with the risks involved really necessitated parental guidance. So a child might have a second amendment right to purchase arms, but because they're dangerous, you need parental permission to do it. Um, minors cannot marry without parental permission because marriage is supposed to be a serious life altering commitment. Um, whether you say the pledge or not, not so much. 
right? And, and, and quite frankly, at least with older students, um, they're mature enough to make the decision on this kind of, uh, they're, they're, they're mature enough to make this kind of decision. But even if parents' rights applied in schools, and they don't, and even if parents' rights can be used against their children rather than against the state, which they can't, and even if they can be used to the detriment of the children, which they're not supposed to be, they're not absolute. Even with abortion, coming back, working a little bit of abortion in this discussion, even with abortion, the Supreme Court has, has required parental permission to get an abortion, but only if there is a judicial bypass option, only if there's an option for the, for the child, to extra, the, the minor to exercise the constitutional right without their parent's permission. So if a parent can't veto your abortion, they certainly should not be able to veto your decision about whether to recite the pledge or not. Um, you know, let's be honest here. These laws in Texas and in Florida, they're not about supporting parents. They are about supporting state orthodoxy. Um, they're about suppressing dissent and criticism of the government. And in the black, in the context of the Black Lives Movement, you could even argue they're about white supremacy. Um, and they are most definitely and blatantly unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, great talk. Uh, so let's open it up first among the, the three panelists and then I may have a question or two as well. So uh, I think you can just speak up as you as you wish, Jesse, Nadia, and Caroline between the three of you. And then, as I say, I may have a question or two as well. I've got a question for, for Caroline, if I can pipe up. Um, I was sort of fascinated to hear about the case that you described and, you know, obviously all of your explanations. Um, how did the court address the issue that you pointed out about parental rights being exercised against the state as opposed to against their children? Like, was there even any claim of parental rights or was that just kind of brought in as a justification by the courts? It was brought in as a justification by the courts. And I think they dodged a lot of these questions rather than addressing them head on, as far as, far as I can recollect. If I can jump in on that, and then I actually do have a, a question for Nadia too, but like my question for you, Caroline, is along these lines is sort of, I mean, I, so, so you pointed out that there, the parental rights don't like extend to controlling what goes on with the school curriculum, but I think there are cases, and you can tell me I'm wrong, but I think there are cases where um, parents are found to have a right to like opt out of certain, opt their children out of certain programs. So, I mean, I just wonder, like, and this, that's more what this looks like, right? Like if, if the sex ed curriculum violates their religious beliefs or something like that. And so I'm, you know, but I hadn't, and I guess until the keynote lecture too, I hadn't kind of made this connection between the sort of everything else, the free speech claim here and everything else that goes on at the school, right? Like I, that's a, those opt-out claims are a claim not to control the student's speech, but they are to control the student's kind of access to information or something. So I, I'm just trying to figure out like, where is the line in this context? Honestly, I don't think that, that they, um, to the ex I don't know the cases where they have the right. I think it might have been provided. And to the extent there might be a right, I would guess it was grounded in religion rather than anything else. And you know how religious rights may sometimes trump what else normally goes on. Um, on the contrary, there's a whole slew of cases where parents have made arguments about what they wanted to happen with their child in the school that was rejected. And so it's everything from, you know, books with diverse parents or 
health education programs or mandatory community service or access to, or uniforms. Like again and again, parents assert a right to state what should go on in the school with regard to their kids. And the answer has been no, the right does not extend this far. Those cases tend to be evaluated just under rational basis scrutiny. So again, I, I don't think, you know, doctrinally, um, as I said, the right is something we all learned about in con law, but um, it doesn't have much force in the schools themselves. And so why all of a sudden, and, and usually anytime they're raised, the state immediately pushes back against it because you can imagine the landslide of lawsuits that would follow if parents suddenly had a say that when went on in the schools. And so the fact that this is the one time where they don't just accept it, but argue it's the reason for trying to get around a well-established Supreme Court case on the constitutional right against compelled speech sort of raises questions about pretext. I know, I know Jesse has a question for Nadia, but let me just jump in a little bit just to sort of push it, Caroline. I mean, suppose you have a parent who in fact wants the kid to say the Pledge of Allegiance, okay? And the kid doesn't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance, either takes a knee or for whatever other reason doesn't want to participate. The parent then says to the kid, okay, you're not going to be uh, on the football team. Uh, I'm not going to permit you to participate or otherwise disciplines the child. Is the implication of your argument, really, if you took it to its logical extension, that the state could intervene directly in that family relationship? Or maybe that takes us back to the morning's uh, discussion about the limits of the state action doctrine. But it seems like, you know, that the parent does have control. And I guess you're how, how, I guess to put it differently, why would your argument no. not apply? Or maybe it would. I think we're talking about two separate things. You're talking about what the parent may do at home. I'm talking about a state law that says, despite Barnett, which held that the school cannot force a child to say the pledge, we have a law that says the child must say the pledge unless the parent says the child doesn't have to say it. And that's a completely different thing than what a parent may do at home. There's so a you're really law, and the justification is for it, for something that on its face is pretty obviously unconstitutional. And the justification for it is, oh, we're just trying to help parents sort of control so the parent, the I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I, I see obviously the, the big difference you're talking about. So you're really not saying the parent can't veto, you're saying the parent cannot veto if uh, the veto is to affect what the school itself is doing, right? I'm saying the parents don't have a claim against the school. The parents can't bring a lawsuit and say, the school, you must stop doing this in the school because it invades my right as a parent. But the kid could still be out of luck. I guess it's the only point I'm making. If the parent really does not want uh, the, the kid to object to pledge, we still have that zone of personal family life that presumably will still be immunized. What's, and what's also probably, and I didn't even get into this, is it's, it's not the other way around, right? These are not laws that say, you know, at the beginning of the semester, we're going to send home a, a, a permission slip and parents let us know whether you want your child to say the pledge or not say the pledge, and we're going to enforce your preference. The default is you say the pledge unless you opt out. And so it's not really about trying to honor the parents' wishes. It's really about trying to force the child to say the pledge and get around Barnett. So I have a question for, um, oh, wait, Jesse, you're, Jesse, you're yeah, first. Jesse, you are open, yeah, and I, I'll ask one about you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask Nadia, I mean, I thought that your presentation was also very interesting and I, um, you know, I, I've seen other takes on how these abortion specific informed consent requirements are different from like traditional informed consent requirements, but they tend to focus more on the like scope of what must be disclosed, right, as opposed to your um, tort law, um, common law approach. And I guess I'm just wondering, like, 
you know, what, what is kind of, what is the upshot in your view then? Does this, um, you know, what you laid out, the ways in which these, again, these requirements are just nothing like an informed consent requirement. They just don't resemble it in any structural way either. I mean, does that provide another ground for challenging these laws or, or showing that they um, should be considered just pure compelled speech because they don't fit in this framework? Is that kind of where it's going or are you not willing to go that far? Um, I guess I'd be curious to, to understand more what you mean by that. I mean, it, it sounds to me like what you're saying is these laws, we shouldn't even be calling these informed consent laws because that is not what they are doing, right? Um, because that's not their goal, that's not their structure, that's not how they operate. Um, and, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. But I think as a practical matter, any law that requires a doctor to communicate information to patients in order to secure their consent to choose a procedure or not, like that's informed consent. That's the, that's the, the kind of the, the idea of informed consent. And so even though it doesn't fit into the common law model of what that requires, like that's what we're talking about. I, and so I, you know, I, I, I understand that um, that is, not the intent necessarily of the, you know, of the legislators passing these laws, but I think it would be disingenuous to call them anything other than informed consent laws because that's how, that's how they're being framed. And so I think the best way to sort of challenge them is on those grounds. I think it would be a lot harder to say, to, to argue these aren't informed consent laws. And like, you know, Again, I agree with you. They don't fall into that traditional scope. But as a like as a definitional matter, you know. I mean, another thing, actually, that's interesting. I mean, another it just occurs to me. Another distinction is that they often don't. They often carry, in addition to tort type penalties, criminal penalties for mm -hmm. violation, right? So and another, um, and disciplinary as well. Um, so state medical right. boards can discipline doctors who who fail to do this. Right, which makes them very unlike. I mean, I guess, yeah, I, it, but but then again, like there's no sort of defense on that on these grounds, right? Because I mean, the statutory law can just deviate from the common law right. framework, right? So exactly, yeah. right. It's just th there haven't been any other context that I am aware of where statutory law has has gone so far from the common law of informed consent in the name of informed consent. Mm -hmm. Caroline, did you have? I had a question for Jesse. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I completely agree that these kinds of claims have a lot in common and it would seem logical that their analysis should be in step with each other. The one question I have though is, might the divergence be due to, in the religious context, when you're talking about the inward concern, mm -hmm. is this they're, the courts are so deferential because they're worried about the establishment clause concern of the courts deciding theological questions beyond their institutional competence. In other words, the court saying, you say this is a substantial burden on your religious belief, but we disagree with you, right? That's, that's the, you know, that whole concern about being, mm -hmm. about intruding on sort of religious questions, who decides, right? Is a court really gonna dictate what a religion does or does not require? Now, I agree with you that courts have been too deferential to this concern because I do think there are objective ways to make these evaluations. But is there a risk that if they do go hand in hand, what will happen is we won't see fewer acceptance of the religious claims, we'll see more acceptance in the free speech arena. And so we'll have even more, um, more Lochnerarian First Amendment as a result. Yeah, although I wonder, I mean, um, you know, it's a, so yeah, so a couple thoughts. I mean, yeah, I, I, I do recognize that concern. And I think, you know, at some point it's a question of, 
you know, how, how far are we willing to just ab abdicate, right, judicial responsibility in this area? I have, I just think it's gotten to a problematic degree because the, the flip side is, you know, an extremely deferential approach that means that you can just assert it, right? And they often, the, the religious claimants just barely bother to sort of tease out what the actual burden is on their religion, you know, and it, it, they often appear to be these complicity claims, but they don't even need to really spell them out because we just take it at face value that like X violates my religion. So, so I yeah. agree there. I mean, why, why would they spell them out if it's not required, right? Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, and I think there's a cost to that too, um, I guess. And so, right, it, it is kind of this question of like, what it's more uh, like where on the spectrum should we be landing? I think we've gone too far in the one, one direction. Um, although I, I hadn't thought about the angle of like, is it possible that we'll just start giving deference to corporations in these compelled speech claims too, right? And I guess that is possible. Um, and maybe there's a way to think about this in a more fine-tuned, both kinds of claims, the internal harms in a more fine-tuned way, right? Because the internal harms are, are harder to see with respect to like corporate entities than they are with respect to individuals. You know, corporate entities don't have bodies and you know, souls and, but, or maybe they do, right? But but I think that you know the the external harms are, are a lot easier to see and a lot easier to deal with um, as well. Just but yeah, a quick follow up on that. I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the the external side, you know, the idea of scandal does look very similar to the to the secular speech context. Mm -hmm. the in, inward looking, I'm not so sure. I, I mean, I mean that genuinely as a question because you know you really are pushing it to fundamental issue that lots of folks have worried about, which is, is religion special? Is religion distinctive? So that is it the same for a person to say that my integrity, not so much bodily integrity, but my integrity as a human being is, is suffering. So I, I'm having an internal injury of that kind. Does it matter that the claim is instead that I am sinning and I am violating what for some folks is understood to be of, of a Kind of a another source of law almost depending on one's religious perspective so i'm not quite sure they fit but it, it, it's it, it's certainly worth uh, considering the only other point is that this idea of complicity is kind of hard to cabin i think as well if you think about uh, thompson uh, thomas versus review board this is the jehovah's witness who refused to make steel Mm -hmm. because the steel would be made into munitions, the munitions would be used in war. Okay, mm -hmm. well, at one level, that is a complicity claim, right? He would be complicit in war down the road. On the other hand, he's doing something himself. He's making the steel. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't have a question over that, but, but I, it's just not obvious to me where complicity goes uh, or how far it might extend. And then the only other point, you know, when you mentioned uh, Kim Davis, I mean, at one level, you know, if if in fact the law is enforced against anybody despite a religious claim, you could construe that to mean, well, they haven't violated their religion. They're being forced by the state to do whatever the state has told them to do. Maybe they've litigated it, but they've lost. Mm -hmm. So at that point, their claim should disappear. So, and actually that in some ways makes sense. I mean, maybe in the complicity context, but why not likewise in any other religious freedom context? If the state demands you do it, you know, you're doing it under protest, but mm -hmm. you're just mm -hmm. doing what the state is telling you to do. And at least if you have a volitional Western religion understanding religion, mm -hmm. if it's not within your control, perhaps you haven't sinned at all. So in, in any case, that's more of a comment, I guess, than a question. Yeah. yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So let's, I mean, let's open it up. Uh, unless you have more, Jesse, I was going to say, let's open it up to at yeah. least the other folks who are panelists. And if anybody has a Q&A um, from the broader audience, uh, please use the, the chat feature for that. <laughs> or the Q&A feature, I should say. But if we have no questions from the broader group, we can keep chatting. Um, so, uh, seeing no questions, um, I'm going to turn to Jesse. Mm -hmm. In terms of the attribution 
and disassociation. Um, I guess I wanted, what, what's your take on the disassociation approach, right? Is disassociation, is the opportunity to disassociate ever gonna be sufficient to sort of defeat um, those kinds of claims? Is it context specific or is it just kind of like a uniform rule? Can you disassociate or not? And what implication does that have? Yeah, I mean, and I don't, I, I have to say that I, I don't think that it ever, you know, it ever is the dispositive factor. You know, I think it is a factor that courts certainly look at. And so um, I would say, I definitely think that there's a, um, uh, a contextual, you know, it, it, that it is very contextual. And again, I, I'm a little, um, I'm a little skeptical that it addresses the sort of, again, the sort of psychic harm or whatever of compelled speech itself. Although again, I think that there may be a distinction here for um, you know, corporate speakers or organizational speakers versus um, uh, you know, individuals who are being forced to, to use their own you know, resources and, um, and mind to speak. Um, because like, I, I, really, I really do struggle to see how um, a business that can post a sign saying, you know, we're required to tell you this, but we think it's bunk, you know, um, it, you know, I, there may be certain limits on that at some point, maybe you are going to get in trouble for doing that. And so you can't come, but as long as the law allows you to disassociate, and I don't think you always can disassociate depending on the, um, on the nature of the act. But I mean, I, you know, I, I do think that it, it makes those compelled speech claims, at least in um, maybe organizational contexts, a lot, a lot weaker. I think it is harder for individuals to kind of speak out of both sides of their mouths. Whereas like, I think corporations can sort of say, you know, here, here's the official line and here is, here's how we feel about it. So maybe that's my tentative, tentative thought. That sounds reasonable. Yeah, I don't I know. Have, uh, again, others raise your hand or jump in, but uh, for Nadia, I was thinking as you were talking about uh, my colleague, Jody Madeira has written about sperm donation and doctors using their own sperm uh, when uh, to impregnate women who have fertility issues uh, or whose families have fertility issues. Um, so how might a tort proceed, if at all, under conventional common law principles by a woman against a doctor who has a perfectly healthy baby uh, from the doctor, unbeknownst to her, uh, would that be a cognizable tort claim? Uh, or is that an area that would be barred under conventional torts uh, principles because no physical harm, you know, uh, I guess you'd have causation to a psychic injury or a moral claim. Uh, what would be, I'm just curious as to what the analysis would be there. I'm wondering if there are other places that maybe the law should recognize in tort law some kind of injury that is not tangible uh, in, a, in the way that the usual common law tort claim might proceed in a malpractice case? Um, no, that's a great question. And I, uh, oops, sorry. Um, and I'd refer you to the work of Dove Fox, who's done a, a lot of really great writing on reproductive negligence and the fact that there are many contexts, he, you know, he talks about those cases as well as the cases where, you know, the, the um, IVF facility, the freezer went down and so the, you know, the, the eggs and sperm were destroyed. Um, that in many of those contexts, there, there isn't really a clearly cognizable remedy. And so he argues for kind of the recognition of a, a tort of reproductive negligence. Um, particularly to address that point, that there are some types of harms, um, some type of dignitary harms that don't fit neatly within those doctrines. I'm actually working on another piece um, about kind of ethical malpractice and the fact that claims by, um, by patients that their doctors violated ethical norms, a lot of those don't fit into the boxes of malpractice or battery or negligent infliction of emotional distress. So there's, um, you know, there, there are a lot of gaps that maybe tort law should be filling those gaps, but right now it's not. Shauna Schifrin's, Shauna Schifrin's undergraduate thesis was on the tort of wrongful birth. 
exactly on your point. So, so just one quick follow up, Matty. Uh, uh, yeah, would you prefer that not to be dealt with stat by statute? I mean, is it course versus stat? Uh, would you prefer that that be developed as a common law response? Or would that be preferable to letting? I mean, in other words, are you open a can of worms in terms of your other concerns? If you begin to have statutes saying, okay, sperm donation, that's distinctive. We're going to recognize a claim for, uh, as my colleague Jody has put it, sort of just the yuck factor of learning that your baby uh, is father is the doctor, even apart from any other injury. In other words, should, should, should we keep the courts out, of, let the courts do it, but not let the legislature mess around with it? You know, I, I have mixed feelings about that um, because there obviously there are situations where a profession is not able to effectively self-regulate um, and sometimes, you know, an appropriate response might be for the legislature to step in. Um, legislation is kind of more fixed and absolute and harder to deviate from. Um, I, I think that common law has um, in the context of you know, medical liability generally done a fairly good job at that gap filling function, right? Informed consent, that was not part of medical practice, essentially before the courts started acknowledging it as a right of patient autonomy in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? Um, after that, uh, legislatures passed informed consent statutes, most of which just really reiterate the common law doctrine. Um, but I think that common law can be a lot more nimble in addressing these harms. That's, that's sort of my, my initial take, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility of needing legislative intervention um, in, in some contexts. You know, it, we see this in the context of medical research, right? The federal common rule and the Belmont report, all that was passed in the immediate aftermath of publicity regarding the Tuskegee syphilis trials. Right? And that's because clearly the profession was not able to self-regulate appropriately and winding through the common law system was not a sufficient response um, to the injuries that, that were suffered. I see that, that Alex has a question. I could read it or do you want to articulate it yourself, Alex? Oh, yes. Uh, so there's been a, thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I think it's a great panel. I, uh, Caroline, I was wondering, do you think that this 11th circuit holding it can be explained by the general erosion of the wall of separation and the establishment clause cases moving from the lemon test through the endorsement and now the history test? I, I know that there's parental substantive rights issues that are unique here, but is this, is it about, you know, free exercise? There's much more, there are these, this litigation, obviously Masterpiece Cake Shop is, is one where there's free exercise as well, but is it partly also the erosion of the establishment clause uh, doctrine or, or is it very dissimilar? I didn't read the case, you, you, so maybe you can tell us from that. Yeah, I think, um, I definitely think that there could be an establishment clause challenge to a mandatory pledge in that it is a state sanctioned statement about being a nation under God. And so the establishment clause in theory is supposed to say this government should not be in the business of endorsing any particular religious belief, such as, for example, we are one nation under God. That establishment clause doesn't exist anymore. Um, as Alex pointed out, we, we the, the Supreme Court has reimagined the Establishment Clause in a way that allows those kinds of government endorsements of religion if they have existed for long enough. So if the constitutional violation dates to the founding, it's no longer a constitutional violation. And I'm sort of... Um, but I think the development of the Establishment Clause is really separate and distinct from what was happening in the 11th Circuit decision because the claims were not really based on opposition to saying the under God part or a challenge to having it in the school system at all. Um, and so I think it's not related. I really think it is more about the 
Pledge of Allegiance as a site of political resistance today, um, particularly with regard to race. And I think that um, these are states that have a history of problematic relations with, um, have had, you know, the, I, I don't think it's an accident that the states that require recitation of this patriotic exercise are two very conservative states. One, one sense in which the, you know, the shifts on the establishment plus side could be relevant maybe to Jesse is that even though the context is very different, I mean, to the extent that the Supreme Court and establishment cases, especially funding cases, uh, basically seems to be minimizing the distinctive character of religion, albeit in a different setting, I mean, that could contribute to the cultural understanding that, hey, we should have equality between religious perspectives, non-religious perspectives. So it actually could support your thought that maybe uh, in the setting you're dealing with, we ought to treat them the same way. Yeah, and I actually didn't go into it because I planned my time poorly, but I actually had pulled my kind of view about how um, courts should deal with this um, attribution and disassociation in the complicity context from some of those establishment clause cases, which um, where the court looks at like how broad is the program, how many recipients are there, and if you are one of many, it looks a lot less like an endorsement of religion. Or you know, it's, this is a kind of like going by the wayside um, view of the establishment clause, also. But those older cases where the court said if this is a really broad social program, you look less like you are endorsing the religion in particular, and then. Also, just the idea that if there's a third party involved whose actions kind of independent actions cut off the, the link from government to religion, then that is also less of less likely to be sort of attributing religious motivations to the government. So yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, there, a hand up, uh, Robert. Thanks. So this is a question about um, what I think is happening in this doctrine that you correctly point to, which is that the religious clause cases and the free speech cases are sort of coming together in ways that are really interesting. And um, after a while of being separated, they're now coming back together again. And I've thought this about the religion clauses and the free speech clause for a long time, which is that um, the religion clauses originally imagined religion as orthogonal and separate from politics. So the political system passes a rule, like you have to have a social security card or you have to go to school and it intersects with religion, which is separate from the sphere of politics and it interferes with their ability to practice their religion. And the, the identification of a practice or a conviction as religious stemmed from the fact that they were separate from politics. They had a structure, a doctrine, a form, a history, which made them identifiable. Now, what happens in the 1980s uh, with Ronald Reagan is for the first time you get an alliance of Protestants and Catholics and you get it aligned with the polit political party. And what's happening now is that the, it's almost indistinguishable what is a religion and what's a political position. Mm -hmm. So why should the evangelicals be opposed to global warming? <laughs> what's up to global warming and eventually, right? So what you see is this almost entire entire overlap between what is formally said to be religion and what is actually in the in, in everyday world um, politics. And you can't distinguish what, in, at least in the Protestant religion, what's religious because there's no structure. It's not like the Catholic Church where it goes back 150 years and there's a college of whatever to tell you what official doctrine. So my religion is what I tell you. That's a very Protestant thing. But on the other hand, if the religion turns out to be a political position, why the hell should it be getting special treatment? Then you're giving certain political actors two shots at the apple. Mm -hmm. And as the religious impulse begins to become inseparable, are inseparably connected. And you see it, I think, absolutely clearly in the mask issues over COVID, that the political and the religious are the same thing. And insofar as that's true, um, I think it deeply undermines these religion clauses as giving separate um, and unusual protections. And I, I think sociologically, at least that's what's happening. And I don't know quite how to unpack that in the doctrine, but it, 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 it just strikes me as um, unsustainable. 
absolutely. And I, and I wonder if the roots go back even further than the 80s. I mean, maybe to the time when we put under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and, you know, the states, you know, the, anyway, I think that maybe the, the 50s would even be a, 40s, 50s would even be a, a starting point. But they weren't partisan back then. No. The same way that it's partisan now. It's mm -hmm. one political party, a set of political positions, mm -hmm. and it's indistinguishable from the evangelicals or the, you know, it's now Q, I mean, whatever it is, it's exactly... Mm -hmm political in the in the traditional sense of political. Mm -hmm. I have one chat question and, and then, then we have, have to uh, cut it off. Uh, this is from uh, Raymond Hampstead, uh, alumnus 1967, political legislative result requiring physicians to advise of certain information to constitute informed consent is caused by and based upon religious grounds. Maybe this goes to what Robert's saying. Why must it be called a political event when it's religiously based or driven? <laughs> yeah, I think that, that goes directly to what Robert was talking about. You know, the, 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 the sort of flip side of that is that if we, um, or kind of an interesting angle there is that if we start viewing these religiously motivated political uh, legislative requirements, as being religious in nature, well, then, then you've got establishment clause issues coming in. Um, you know, with the informed consent requirements, you can make that argument with respect to the, you know, the human being and personhood disclosure. Um, but with respect to the other things, I think it's a lot harder. You know, disclosing that a father has a duty to pay child support that may be motivated by a religiously motivated anti-abortion position, um, but it doesn't. You know, sort of translate into the language that's being used. And though I, I've always, I've always thought it was a shame. I personally believe that most opposition to abortion is religiously based, and so I, I'm, I'm always sad uh, that we don't have an establishment clause that would allow you to challenge all these laws as trying to encode one religious view onto the rest of the country in violation of the Establishment Clause. So and that's gonna be the panel, that's gonna be the next symposium. A year from now, uh, we'll get to, the, get to that issue. We are out of time. So let me turn this over, not to Steve, I'm told to turn it over to Reese. So I will. Thank you panelists, by the way, great, great, uh, great paper, papers. Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you to our panelists, um, Professor Sawicki, Professor Corbin, and Professor Hill. That was a really thoughtful and thought-provoking discussion. Um, and I'm sure we're about to have yet another one for our last panel of the day, which will begin at 3.15. We're going to take a short break right now, so we will see everyone back here at 3.15. Thank you guys one more time. <laughs>